it's, uh, it's wonderful for judges to have an opportunity to uh, lift their heads from their desks and look around and hear what other people are saying about our work. Uh, we tend to decide cases uh, one by one, which is what you would expect, but uh, that doesn't give you the opportunity to, uh, to prick up your ears and hear what people are saying about your work and thinking about the larger perspective in which you're deciding cases. So it's a joy to have that kind of opportunity, and I thank the organizers for thinking of them. Thirty years ago, when I graduated from Osgood, I knew nothing about immigration and refugee law. I'm not even sure there was a course offered at that time. I, if there was, I didn't know anything about it. And uh, after graduation, for the next 20 years uh, or so thereafter, I kept my ignorance pretty well intact uh, until about 10 years ago uh, when I was appointed to the, the federal court. And I must say, since then, for the past almost 10 years, I found myself absorbing and being absorbed by immigration and refugee law. Before my appointment as uh, Dean Sawson, I pointed out that I had some experience in criminal law, especially criminal law reform, working in areas all the way from police powers, criminal procedure, the laws of evidence, the general part of the criminal code, general principles of liability, sentencing, and so on. So it was natural when I started hearing and deciding immigration and refugee cases that I was often struck and particularly interested in the intersections between criminal law and immigration and refugee law, and there are many. I don't know, however, with whether having a familiarity with criminal law is an asset or an obstacle, even at this point in time. For reasons I'll explain in a few minutes, from time to time I sense it is the latter. I keep bumping into issues that appear not to have been decided by other judges, and I've struggled to work out issues uh, like how the concepts of mens rea, secondary liability, modes of participation in crime, burdens and standards of proof, and affirmative defenses, how they all operate within the immigration and refugee law system, which builds, at least in part, on concepts of criminal law, at least in terms of there being uh, matters that depend upon a finding that someone has committed a crime. As I said, there are many points of, of intersection, and I certainly won't go through them all today, uh, but I, I'm going to concentrate on, on a couple. Uh, before I get into it, I must say I find that uh, there was, I found there was quite a bit of rigor when I was doing criminal law. The kinds of concepts we would apply were quite strictly interpreted. Things like mens rea, actus reus, uh, what, what aiding and abetting means, uh, what conspiracy means, or attempting to commit a crime. And all these things come up in the immigration and refugee law context, uh, but, and they, but they seem a bit mushy to me, and, and I, that sounds like a pejorative adjective, and, a, and it is, I suppose, in a way, but I don't mean it to be critical. I think that inherently we expect immigration and refugee law to look at those same kinds of issues in a less rigorous way, a more porous and malleable way. Uh, the two areas often use similar or identical language. The principles lying behind the terminology are relevant in both domains, but the way those principles play out in the criminal law is sometimes markedly different than is the case in immigration and refugee law. Also, we must recognize that there are different purposes lying behind them, and those purposes come to bear on how we interpret the respective legislation, whether it be the criminal code or the immigration and refugee protection. I'd like very much to explore many of these areas of intersection, but I can't do that today. I'll leave that for another day, another forum, more pro properly in writing than in a public address, probably. Uh, so I'm just going to address a, a couple of topics. Uh, and those relate mainly to the concept of exclusion from refugee protection and the concept of inadmissibility to Canada. 
I'll lay out some of the, uh, the jurisprudence on these subjects and show how courts have shaped them by often giving broad but sometimes narrow interpretations of the key terms. I will illustrate this with some examples from my own judgments. Then I'll conclude with some observations about the extent to which the pr principles of the criminal law might apply in the immigration and refugee context. A few uh, instructive words before I begin. There is a general consensus in the judiciary that judges should not talk about their own judgments in public. And there's a very sensible reason for that. The law is what judges say it is in their written work, in their written judgments. The law is not what judges say they said in their written work when they give a public address. So imagine it's difficult enough we get lawyers presenting us with a vast array of jurisprudence in the immigration area just from the written judgments of, of judges. Imagine if we had also to consider what judges said out of court about those subjects. So there's a, a good reason why ju judges are reticent to speak in public about their own decisions. However, there's a little bit of leeway in this rule, and I'm going to rely on the leeway today. When I was uh, executive legal officer at the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, I often accompanied uh, Chief Justice Antonio Romero when he addressed uh, law school classes, whether in Canada or abroad. <clears throat> he believed that judges could discuss their own judgments in a didactic setting like this, where judges are exercising their responsibility to inform students about the Canadian legal system in general and what it is that judges do. So in that spirit, I'm going to talk a little bit about my own judgments, but I instruct you to find the law in my written decisions, not in what I say to you today. Better still, look at the decisions of the Court of Appeal or, or even judges, uh, decisions of judges, uh, of some, some of my colleagues. Two areas, as I mentioned, I'll use as examples are rules of exclusion from refugee protection and inadmissibility. The term exclusion applies only to refugee status. And persons who are excluded will not be granted refugee status even if they meet the definition of a refugee, that is, if they have a well-founded fear of persecution in their country of origin. Article 1 of the Refugee Convention of 1951 is incorporated into our domestic legislation, states that persons are excluded from refugee status if they've committed a crime against peace, a war crime, or a crime against humanity, a serious non-political crime, or acts contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. Excluded claimants will not receive refugee protection if they have no other means of gaining status in Canada, they will generally be removed and will have to seek authorization to return. Inadmissibility, by contrast, is a, is a broader concept. It can apply to anyone seeking admission to Canada, whether or not they have refu a refugee claim, such as a person seeking permanent resident status as a skilled worker or a sponsored member of the family class. The grounds of admissibility include a variety of security concerns, engaging in terrorism, committing acts of violence, or being a member of a group engaged in any of those kinds of conduct. But it also extends to international rights violations and serious forms of organized criminality. Persons who are inadmissible cannot obtain permanent resident status and will be subject to removal. Here's the first area of intersection between criminal law and immigration and refugee law that I'd like to discuss with you, and it relates to exclusion. Remember, persons are excluded if they have committed, that's the language that's used, committed various kinds of crime, crime against peace, a war crime, crime against humanity, serious non-political crime. It is clear from the word commit that the actual perpetrators of these crimes are excluded. But who else? In the criminal law, we have rules of liability that, that extend to secondary parties, haters and abettors, persons pursuing a common purpose, counselors, accessories, and so on. 
as well as those uh, to those who commit incomplete versions of the complete crime, that is, those who conspired to, to commit crimes or who attempt to commit crimes. The question is, are these various categories, modes of participation, other kinds of criminal liability included within the concept of committing a crime within the rules of exclusion in the refugee protection? In fact, the word committed has, in this context has been interpreted as including actual perpetrators of crimes, no surprise, but also those who are complicit in those crimes. Uh, but this is only a partial answer because that just takes us uh, to the word complicit to see if that tells us who else is included. When a person with a criminal law background like me hears the word complicity, he or she will probably think of those areas of secondary liability I mentioned, like aiding and abetting or pursuing a common purpose, and other kinds of accessories, uh, he or she might wonder whether it, it extends as far as the inchoate offenses or incomplete crimes, such as conspiracy or attempts, but that would be a matter for discussion. In fact, Justice Gilles Letourneau, who is a former colleague of mine, at the Law Reform Commission of Canada, we used to do criminal law reform together. He's now a judge on the Federal Court of Appeal. Has held that complicity in this context only includes modes of participation, that is, aiding and abetting and so on, but not complete crime. This approach appears to suggest, for example, that someone who conspired to commit a war crime but did not actually commit it would not be excluded from refugee protection while someone who aided and abetted such a crime might be excluded. It's obviously worth considering whether the exclusion clauses were intended to be interpreted that way, and in particular whether it makes sense that a person who aids and abets a war crime, for example, should be excluded from refugee protection, while another person who conspired to carry one out should not. In other words, but a fairly narrow concept of complicity taken from the criminal law really serve us well immigration and refugee context. In reality, though, that's not a matter for serious concern because with that one exception, we see that the concept of complicity is actually applied quite broadly in the immigration and refugee context. Let's just stay for a moment within the area of rules of exclusion. Complicity, rather than being a generic rubric for modes of participation in offenses, as it is in the criminal law, is often treated as an independent basis for exclusion from refugee protection with few parameters. Case law tells us that complicity means personal and knowing participation in an offense. This looks like what we would think of in the criminal law as a mens rea and actus reus, participation being the, the act and knowledge of the consequences being the mental element. But this duality of concepts that's so familiar to us in the criminal law and forms one of the most fundamental principles of the criminal law is not applied in the immigration and refugee context in the same way at all. Let me summarize briefly what the case law says about this. The cases tell us that complicity can take two forms. The first involves the actual furthering furthering of international crimes by the claimant. This would include parties to offenses. The second, however, involves what is referred to as complicity by association. Complicity by association simply means that individuals may be rendered responsible for the acts of others because of their close association with the principal actors. Given that broad meaning, the requirements of knowledge and actual participation in the crime seems to be a secondary concern. This becomes even clearer when we look at cases dealing with membership in a group responsible for crimes. And I'm going to spend a minute going through these cases because they raise an important issue and a difficult matter of interpretation, I think, in our immigration and refugee law. The concept of membership in a criminal organization is problematic Membership is a concept that's not used in the criminal law, so we can't have resort to the criminal law for that. Criminal law actually uses terms like knowledge 
participation and contribution, which as I said a minute ago is where immigration and refugee law started out looking at issues of complicity. Before immigration and refugee law st started to drift into other concepts of criminal li liability for crimes. Starting from that idea that complicity connotes knowing participation, the general rule in Canadian case law is that mere membership in an organization that commits crimes that would be caught by the exclusion clauses does not justify that person's exclusion from refugee protection. But there's an exception to that rule that, that arose in the Canadian case called Ramirez. And the exception applies where the organization in issue is one that has a limited brutal purpose. For that kind of organization, proof of membership may be sufficient to find the person was complicit in the crimes carried out by the organization and the person would be excluded from refugee protection. In this case, membership in the group creates a rebuttable presumption which may result in a finding of complicity in the absence of any other evidence other than membership. Complicity can be presumed in that situation on the basis of the strong likelihood that the person must have known about the group's objects and that his or her involvement furthered the group's aims. Now, as I mentioned, this can operate as a presumption. Canadian judges seem to have a fascination with presumptions. This is one that comes up frequently. The other one that comes up often is the presumption of state protection. Both have created problems, in my view, in, uh, in the evolution of the jurisprudence in uh, immigration and refugee law. But I'll stick for the moment to this presumption of complicity. In effect, the presumption lightens the onus on the minister. The minister uh, uh, bears the evidentiary burden to show that someone should be excluded from refugee protection. But it lightens that burden because it's easier to conclude that the person knowingly participated in the group's activities where there's evidence that he or she was a member. But even where the presumption applies, the decision maker, usually an immigration and refugee board, must review the evidence to determine whether the presumption has been rebutted and in doing so should consider other relevant evidence. The presumption can be rebutted by proof on the part of the refugee claimant that he or she had a lack of knowledge or an absence of direct involvement in the group's activities. However, where the role of, of, of the concept, or the role of the concept of membership in a criminal organization started out as an exception to the general rule that complicity means knowing participation, it began to be used frequently as a shortcut to a finding of complicity. Compounding that phenomenon, the meaning of the word member expanded. It is now accepted that the word member has a broad and unrestricted meaning. Accordingly, virtually any association with an organization committing international crimes would be enough to satisfy the exclusion clauses. Now let me just recap and then we're going to go on and talk about a specific case. So we started off with this notion that that uh, the exclusion clause is extended to those who were complicit in international crimes. Complicity could mean knowing uh, participation in those offenses. There could also be complicity by association. It could involve uh, mere membership in a group that has a limited brutal purpose. If so, complicity could be presumed. So there's kind of sort of a cascading of concepts that is derived from the interpretation of the exclusion clauses through the jurisprudence. But as I said, I've been talking at the level of, dis dis of abstraction. Let me give you a concrete example from one of my own cases. And I'm going to be using initials when I uh, refer to specific cases. And this is the case involving a woman I'll call MP. MP is a citizen of Iran who arrived in Canada in 2004. Two years later, she applied for refugee protection on the basis that she feared reprisals in Iran for having served in the government of the Shah during the 1970s. Beginning in 1973, MP worked for the Army as a telephone receptionist in a military hospital. 
Around 1976, she began informing on behalf of the Shoah's secret police, known as SADAC. She was asked to make audio tapes of any conversations that were suspicious or overtly critical of the Shoah. She performed that role until the revolution of the late 1970s. Thereafter, she says, she went into hiding to avoid repercussions from her association with the Shoah's regime. Finally, in 2004, she left Iran for Canada, where her children were. The Minister, <coughs> excuse me, the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, excuse me, opposed MP's application, arguing that she was excluded from refugee protection based on serious reasons for considering that she had committed a crime against humanity. The Immigration and Refugee Board agreed. Before the board, MP conceded that Sadak had been involved in crimes against humanity. It was well known at the time. The board went on to consider whether MP had been complicit in those crimes. There was no allegation that she had been directly involved in any way. The board defined complicity as involving a common purpose of personal and knowing participation, as I referred to the definition before. However, as we've seen, when the organization's main objective is to commit crimes against humanity, or it exists to achieve a limited brutal purpose, mere membership in the organization raises a presumption of complicity. Here, the board found that MP was presumed to be complicit in Sadak's crimes. The board then considered whether MP could rebut that presumption. It concluded that her conduct and association with Sadak did not displace the presumption of complicity. She was therefore excluded from refugee protection. The case came to me by way of judicial review. Before me, counsel pointed me to case law in the United Kingdom and New Zealand that was critical of the Canadian approach, especially the concept of a presumption of complicity. Instead, the rules of individual liability in the Rome Statute of the Criminal Court should be considered, according to which a person should be considered liable for a crime if he or she orders, solicits, or induce, induces the commission of such a crime, aids, abets, or otherwise assists in its commission, or in any other way contributes to the commission or attempted commission of such a crime by a group of purpose, persons acting with a common purpose. So it was taken to case law from other jurisdictions that said we should be more careful about who we're capturing by these exclusion clauses. And in order to be careful, we should be applying concepts, well-accepted concepts of criminal liability, liability as reflected in the Rome Statute. In my decision, I noted that the Rome Statute does not include membership group as being a basis for liability at all. And that was, of course, one of the main criticisms of the, uh, the courts in the UK and New Zealand in respect of Canadian law. However, after re reviewing the case law, the Canadian case law, I concluded that the Canadian approach could be reconciled with the UK and New Zealand case law, so long as we went back to the first principles of complicity recognized forms of participation in offenses and corresponding mental elements. While I was invited to do so, I did not have to conclude that the presumption of complicity based on membership in a criminal group should be abolished, since, as it was originally intended, it was only meant to be a very narrow exception to the general rules of complicity that did not contradict the rules set out in the Rome Statute in any case. However, I allowed the judicial review in order to do a new hearing because after all of the analysis, the board relied on the presumption of complicity in MP's case, but never actually decided that she was a member of SADAC. It applied that presumption that flows from a finding of membership, but it never made that point. So it seemed to me if, it was, if there was going to be any reliance on a presumption of that nature, you had to at least make a finding that the preliminary facts on which the presumption is based would apply. What does this tell us? I think it tells us there's some merit, it 
in at least keeping an eye on principles of criminal law when we're applying related concepts in the context of immigration and refugee law. The jurisprudence on, on exclusion has, by times, applied similar principles, but it has also drifted away from them with concepts of complicity by association and a presumption of complicity based on membership in certain kinds of groups. It's also important to recall the purposes of the exclusion clause. These rules are based on the idea that certain conduct is so serious that those who commit it don't deserve to achieve refugee status. Further, states should not be required to provide protection to serious criminals. These purposes suggest that the exclusion clauses should be interpreted narrowly. Would the framers of the exclusion clauses have anticipated that a telephone operator passed on suspicious messages to her military superiors would be found to have committed a crime against humanity? I don't think there's an obvious answer to that question, but surely the question needs to be asked whether the scope of liability should bear some relationship to accepted criminal law principles, actual fault requirements, and clearer rules about the scope of liability. Perhaps the application of principles of criminal law would help achieve the objective of interpreting the exclusion clauses narrowly. As described, that has not been the prevailing trend in Canadian case law, but perhaps it's headed there. I'd like to address uh, one other question related to the uh, application of criminal law principles in the immigration and refugee context. This time I'll be talking about the rules of, inadmissibility, of, um, of affirmative defenses in the context of rules of inadmissibility. First, let me explain what I mean by an affirmative defense. With respect to provisions in the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, relying on evidence of commission of crimes, this would be the case for both exclusion and inadmissibility, evidence showing that the person lacked the requisite mental element or failed to carry out the prohibited act would obviously negate the conclusion that he or she committed a crime. So lack of knowledge or accident on the one hand and mistaken identity or alibi on the other would defeat an accusation of criminal conduct. That seems fairly clear just from the use of the word committed in that context. But what about a defense like self-defense or necessity, or what I would like to address, duress, where both the mental and physical elements of the crime are already in place? Those are the kinds of defenses that don't negate the presence of the, uh, the elements of the offense. They send you off in a different direction to see whether or not the conduct was justified or excusable. When this issue came before me recently in the context of a defense of duress, I looked at the inadmissibility sections of HERPA and found no reference to defenses. No surprise. The defense of duress in Canadian criminal law is partly statutory in the criminal code and partly common law. But how would either be recognized when the applicable statute, the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, makes no reference to? The easy answer might be, as I discussed a minute ago, to look at the Rome statute, which does indeed contain a defense of duress. But it is fairly clear that the Rome statute applies to the exclusion clauses because they derive from the Refugee Convention, which specifically points to other inter international instruments for interpretation. It is not clear that the same would be true for the rules of inadmissibility, which serve a domestic purpose. Again, let me give a concrete example. SJ, or Colin, was found to be inadmissible to Canada for being a member of an organization engaged in acts of terrorism and subversion and to have committed crimes against humanity in Liberia. He admitted being part of the group that he was associated with but insisted he was held captive by it and that his acts were carried out to avoid being killed. SJ claimed that in late 1992, he was forcibly conscripted by 
and tortured and beaten and then forced to participate in the activities of this violent organization. He maintained that the consequences of failing to follow orders would have been his death. He testified that it was, his role was to go into villages and call out persons of a certain ethnicity. When they came out of their homes, they would be tortured and murdered by these rebels. He would then wait in the truck that they had been using until the raid was finished. The Immigration and Refugee Board found SJ to be inadmissible to, to Canada based on his participation in these raids against civilians even though he might have been forcibly conscripted at the outset. The board began by considering whether SJ could be considered a member of the group. As I've already mentioned, the term member has been given a very broad meaning in the case law. The board concluded that SJ's participation in these acts made him directly responsible for the harm caused to the victims. Given his lengthy and extensive involvement in the raids, their violent nature, his lack of effort to distance himself from the group, and his failure to take steps to protect the victims. The board found SJ fell within the broad definition of a member and found him complicit in the activities of the organization. The board then considered the defense of duress. It accepted the documentary evidence showing that the group had forcibly conscripted individuals but it did not believe SJ's assertion that he was continuously held captive and had no chance to escape. Accordingly, the requirements for the defense of duress were not present. In the end, the board found SJ to be inadmissible to Canada as a member of that group. SJ sought judicial review before me, and I have to say I struggled quite a long time with the question of how the defense of duress related to the concept of liability for crimes under Urba, and more especially how it relates to the concept of membership in a group. I found it difficult to conceive of a situation where a person could be considered a member of the group and at the same time mount a successful defense of duress. In this case, the board proceeded on the assumption that the two issues were entirely separate. It first found SJ to be a member of the group then considered whether the defense of duress had been made out. However, it seemed to me that the two issues had to be considered together. It seemed to be an artificial exercise to me to first determine whether the person was a member of a criminal group and then consider whether the person acted under duress. It seems incongruous that a person could be a genuine member of the group when his or her involvement with it was based on coercion. In looking at the case law on this question, and there wasn't much, I found some support for the notion that membership has a mens rea component. It was surprising to me because, uh, as I said, membership doesn't have uh, much use in the criminal law, but surprisingly in an immigration case I found reference to this concept of mens rea being part of the term membership in the immigration context. This mens rea of membership could be defeated by evidence of duress. To me, this was a novel way of looking at membership, and it doesn't accord with our general understanding of how duress works in the criminal law. As I said, in criminal, in criminal law, duress doesn't defeat a mens rea. It's an affirmative defense. Yet I found this approach appealing because it corresponded with my own instinct that it required consideration of the end of evidence of membership alongside the evidence of coercion. The question to be asked was whether the membership was truly genuine. It couldn't be genuine if it was forced. In any case, however, while I found the board's analysis of the issues to be confusing, I concluded there was no reviewable error. The evidence before the board was that SJ did have a safe avenue of escape on a couple of occasions which meant that the necessary elements of the defense of duress were not present. I therefore dismissed the application for judicial review. These are just two examples of areas where the principles of liability under the criminal law have presented themselves in the immigration and refugee law context. There are many others. The questions to be asked are these. 
do the criminal law principles apply? If so, do they apply in the same way? If not, is there anything to be learned from how they apply in a criminal law context? To what extent are the purposes of the criminal law and of immigration and refugee law similar or different in respect to the particular issue you're considering? Does that help us decide the scope of the exclusion and inadmissibility rules in particular? And more specifically, should the rules of liability in the Rome Statute be the default position? These are questions I hope to be able to spend more time on and possibly answer one or two of them uh, case by case or in some academic writing. Uh, but I can't answer them today, but I present them for your consideration. I thank you for your kind attention. It's got to be one of the most beautiful days of the year, and you've given up a, a wonderful afternoon to spend it in the dark here with me, so I appreciate your attendance. My law clerk will tell you I've been going around and around on these issues I've described to you today over the past year or so, driving her mad, quite probably. But I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to give my thoughts and airing before you this afternoon. Thank you very much.